um, to access interpretation service, just click on the globe icon on your screen, select a preferred language, and then mute the original sound. Prof, if you are ready, we are ready. Thank you. Okay, shall, shall I start? start? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, Kashi 3 uh, is a perennial tree, which is evergreen throughout the year. And uh, it is very good in the mitigation of climate change, particularly in carbon sequestration. Mature cashew tree has three, four stages of growth. The first one is flushing, which is the breaking of dormancy. The second one is flowering, followed by fruiting. And finally, it goes again into a state of dormancy. Cashew tree requires proper management in order to increase yield. As for cashew, good agricultural practices differs quite a lot from other tree crops, particularly when you are considering aspects of stamping or top working. And the top working may differ from other trees in terms of the timing. Thin also, pruning and the training, they differ quite a lot from other three crops. Next. Good agricultural practices in Kashu, it involves the tree management, which means top working, pruning, and training. On the other hand, it also involves farm management operations like intercropping and weeding in order to cut down costs. Tree management normally takes place at the stage of tree dormancy, which normally takes place for two months, and this begins immediately after harvesting. So immediately after Within two months, the pruning and other aspects must take place at that time. Do not do any pruning when the flash starts. So the main objective of the Buddha agricultural practice in Kashu is to increase the yield for the Kashu trees. Secondly, is to increase the plastic quality and also to have easy access to nut picking. On our row, gap in cashew includes, among others, weeding, intercropping, control of diseases and insect pests in East Africa, which is not very common in East Africa, pruning and training, and this is categorized into two. Pruning and training of the grafted ceiling, pruning and the training of trees raised by normal seeds, but normal seeds or normal seeds. Also, it involves harvesting and post harvest handling. Next, please. Pruning different types of cashew trees depends on the source of the seedling. There are two major sources of the seedling, which is vegetatively propagated, and the seedlings raised from seed. So the most common vegetative propagation method is grafted seedlings. Grafted seedlings, they have a tendency of their branches growing laterally because they already have flowering hormones. So they don't have hormones which encourages so we need to be more careful when dealing with the grafted seedlings in order to ensure that uh, we will not uh, uh, destroy the yields. Which means for grafted seedlings, we need to train the branches to grow upwards. Sometimes we might be forced to lift the branches to grow upwards. Why? Because 
drafted the seedlings will produce in the first year, and certainly all of them will produce in the second year. As for trees raised by non grafted seedlings, which means polygonal seed, or clonal seed, or even farmers' own seed, these kind of seedlings, when it grows into the farm, the branches grow upwards naturally. This is because they are growing vegetatively and not growing reproductively. So it needs less care. However, non grafted seedlings will start producing in the third or the fourth year. Next. Pruning. There are three different types of pruning in Kashu. One is formative pruning of young Kashu trees. And formative pruning is done the second and the third year after plant transplanting. And this involves removal of branches which are attached in the ground to approximately 50 centimeters. And to make it easier for the farmers, we use any height as an average of 50 centimeters from the ground. Secondly, we have light growing of mature cutlass annually. After every harvesting season, uh, light growing is necessary. And this involves removal of branches touching the ground to allow harvesting to take place, or it may involve removal of the branches to allow a tractor operation if for large scale farms. The third one is heavy growing of mature cashew trees. This usually takes place once in every three to five years, depending on the soil types, depending on the rainfall, and also depending on the location. And this one, it involves removal of big branches which are obstructing nut picking or obstructing tractor operation in large scale farms. Next. Now, let us come to the right subject, pruning. It should be known that any type of form of pruning cashew branches is reduction in yield because it involves removal of the productive area of the canopy. Pruned branches is almost dollars dropping. As you can see below, the six months old on the plant side, the six or uh, the six months old grafted seedling has already started producing. And if you remove all those branches, even in the year one and the year two, you are already losing your crop. When you look on the right hand side, on the top, there is a tree which has been properly pruned, and on the below, there is a tree which has been over pruned. And this is almost the case to most farms. Next. Now, why do we do pruning if pruning is lost in yield? We do pruning for various reasons. It differs from large scale farmers and small scale farmers. For large scale farmers, we normally prune to allow machinery operation to take place in order to minimize farm 
operational costs. Because for large scale farms, if you do manual milling, sometimes labor is a serious problem. So we will lose a little bit of yield, but save money that would be being used for the cash laborers, which is quite a lot of money. So it means for large scale farmers, we are prone to allow tractor to plow the farm. We are allowed tractor to pass for disease and the pest to control. And also for large scale farms, the transportation of the harvested nuts from different locations. For, for small scale farmers, we will normally prune in order to allow nuts to be collected underneath the tree canopy. I'm repeating again. For small scale farmers, we prune in order to allow nuts to be collected underneath the cashew tree canopy. Secondly, we will also prune in the case of West Africa, for example, to control the theft of the nuts. You do a pruning in such a way that at night, using a torch, you will be able to see if somebody is trespassing into the farm. If you don't do it, for example, in Tanzania, you will find that the people will be harvesting your nuts at night. So you lose a little bit of the nuts by doing a modest pruning in order to save from the nuts which can be collected by the thieves and not otherwise. Also, for a small scale farmer, they do um, um, pruning in order to allow an intercropping. Next. Uh, pruning in order to allow tractor operation in large farms is as displayed. As you can see on both sides of the photo, a tractor has been plowing between the lines in the cashew research farms in Nachingwea in Tanzania. But uh, look at the canopy of the trees. They are not destroyed. They are still maintaining the umbrella shape. So we pruned to allow just a tractor to be able to pass underneath. And if there is any big branch that will block the tractor, that one will be removed during heavy pruning. So, you prune to lose some of the crop at the same time, you prune to gain some economic benefits from farm management operations. Next, please. Now, let us consider what I mentioned previously about the formative pruning to give the canopy or the young developing cash trees an umbrella shape. As I mentioned, grafted seedlings, they have flowering hormones. So they do not normally grow vegetatively. They normally grow reproductively, which means most of their branches, they grow laterally. And if you don't train or prune them, they will be touching the ground. And when they grow bigger, then even uh, the at the proper spacing, you will find that uh, you may need to, to control the overlap of the canopies. So to avoid the future quick overlap of the canopies, we will do normally formative pruning in order to make sure that the, the young growing tree, which is grafted, uh, has an umbrella shape, and all of them are pointing upwards. Next. Training of the cashew tree canopy is one of the uh, good agricultural practices that I mentioned. Um, but this has not really been taking place quite a lot in, in cashew. Um, the photos you see there is um, training of the uh, tree canopy. This one, they are more than 10 years old, the left and the right side. But it is a high density cultivation of a silent orchard in order to provide more science, more science per unit area. But 
In some literature, you will find that uh, some people are talking about high density cultivation by managing the cashew tree canopy not to grow big. As it can be seen on the right hand side, if you do not, if you do not uh, remove the signs, they will all fruit. And uh, basically, this kind of a technology of high density cultivation through management of the cashew canopy cannot be applicable in Africa for only one reason. It is labor intensive. And African farmers, there are so many things to do rather than attending the itself. Next. Now, it should be noted that a young cashew trees up to the age of 10 years, they produce on the entire canopy. On the top, at the middle, and at the below. They all produce. You will have nuts everywhere. But cashew trees at 15 years of age and above, it does not produce on the top. It does not produce on the top. It only produces on the lower branches, which in most cases, some of us will remove them. So why it does not produce on the top at all the age? It's a very long uh, scientific debate, but basically all all the cashew trees never produce at the top. And very little at the middle, but on most cases on the lower branches. Next. I am showing some typical example of um, the photos I just took um, last month when I had a, a team of researchers from National Agricultural Research Institute of Benin. They visited Tanzania, and uh, this is what they saw in the farmer's field. Tanzanian farmers in the main cash growing areas, instead of pruning the trees, they normally use a stake to lift the branches because the production is mostly found on the branches. When you look on the top, all that there, it was showing exactly how trees were producing. And on the top, there was nothing like a fruit setting, which means where these three gentlemen or two gentlemen are standing, if you remove all those branches by pruning in order to have a canopy shaped tree, you would have lost probably 50% of that three yields, which was estimated to be around 50 kilogram per tree per year. Below is another tree on the left hand side. You could see me standing near the tree itself. Half of that tree on the top, it produced nothing. And but where I'm standing, the farmers had raised their the branches and uh, there was a lot of crop. On the left, right hand side, I was making a close zoom for you to see how the stakings have been taking place. Because from outside, maybe it was not easy to see. But actually, on the right inside, you can see how farmers they are doing that kind of raising of the branches instead of pruning them. Because they know if they prune, it is a loss in yield. Next. I just wanted to share with you um, when I was doing my field visit uh, somewhere in Latitengu in Benin, I found a very interesting tree and I was discussing with the farmer. And the farmer was telling me they wanted to remove all the branches in order the tree to, for him, he was talking about 
the retreat to have air circulation and things of that sort. But uh, after the training, you can see on the right hand side, uh, this is what I did, and I showed you that uh, this is how the pruning should be done. If you remove more of those branches, it means you are removing the productive area of the tree canopy, which eventually will lead into low yield. So from this kind of pruning, I uh, advise the farmer to lift some of those branches up so that uh, when they start the fruiting, they will not touch the ground. Next. Yes, I'm giving you um, a typical scenario of what they have gone through. On the top side, I'm showing three years old grafted seedling. On the top, they have been properly pruned. Below, below, there are trees of the same age. And to be very sincere, they are from my own farm. When I was working in Zambia, I requested the director of the research station to provide me with the technicians to go and do formal pruning. And uh, this is what they did. Hidden side is the director of the station. I invited him to see the kind of damage which was done in my own farm. So when I'm talking to you about proper pruning, it's because I have not only the scientific experience, but also as a farmer, it has really affected me a lot. And the trees below there, which were supposed to start producing like the ones at the top, it has taken them four years, not actually to recover the whole canopy, just four years to start giving me a reasonable crop. So please do not destroy your three canopies on young cashew trees. Next. I wanted to share with you also cashew trees which has been taken in good formative pruning at the age of five years in my own farm. So I had a experience of both good formative pruning and bad formative pruning. At this age of five years, this kind of trees can produce between eight and ten years, depending <coughs> on the weather condition. Next. I'm also sharing with you well pruned trees at the age of 10 and the age above 75. As it can be seen, they are all from my farm. We did a formative pruning, and uh, every year we do very, very light pruning. And we only prune, only prune the branches that are attaching the ground. So the tree remains with its canopy, and the only prone to allow nut pollution or cleaning of the farm as it can be seen. The right hand side is a tree which is about, I think, 20 years. But you could see, because it was grafted, it's not very tall. This is one of the hybrids which were crossed, one of my best varieties. But you could see that uh, the tree trunk is very small. I didn't prune all the branches uh, 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 on the trunk above uh, 50 uh, centimeters. All of them were maintained at almost 50 centimeters. And from far, you will see that uh, you see the canopy rather than see the trunk of the tree. Next. Yes, I want to share with you also. Uh, in my field, it visits different farms and different farms. And this is the, the type of 
ruling that has been taking place. Although the top ones are not the graphics, but still you realize that uh, on the top left hand side, the pruning has been done to remove all the branches almost up the shoulder. And uh, this is a serious loss in the yield. This kind of pruning, I can describe it as destructive pruning, but it was done with an intention of improving yields. But in practice, this is not the, the reality. And as you can see below, it is an estate also, but also the pruning has been almost more than a, uh, one meter from the ground, which is not very good. Next. Again, I am not with a very serious concern. When pruning is done, it must be done in such a way it will allow proper healing to take place. When you look at all those cut branches, they were not cut close to the trunk. And once they protrude, you will find that the healing becomes difficult as it can be seen on the right hand side. Actually, this kind of uh, uh, branch cutting, it attracts a stem borers where incidences of stem borers is very high. You cut like this one, really, you will find that you have attracted the stem borers, which might end up uh, destroying the entire tree. Next, please, to see the tree which has been properly cut. So when we are cutting branches during heavy pruning or, or during rehabilitation, when we are trying to uh, ensure that uh, the tree canopy is not overlap, then we have to cut some of the branches. Then the cutting must be close to the trunk, as it has been shown there. And on the right hand side, it is showing how quick the healing normally takes place. Within two years, you find that it has covered the wood completely, and the tree continues growing normally. Next, please. Next. Now, in the conclusion, pruning is a very important good agricultural practice in Kashu, but it must be done with maximum care. Please conduct pruning if and only if it is necessary to allow one, not collection, intercropping, tractor operations in the farm, which means plowing, disease control, fertilization, and transportation of the land. Last but not least, high density cultivation of cashew in Africa is only good for silent orchards, and it's not yet time for doing it for large-scale or medium-scale plantation because it is labor-intensive and African farmers, they have no time really to concentrate only on cashew because they have other issues also to do with their food security. Well, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'm ready uh, for your questions, if you have any. I'm, I'm sure you have a lot of questions, and I'm waiting for that. Merci, professeur. Merci pour ce travail qui est bien présenté. Et merci encore pour la communication. Je rappelle que le professeur Massaoué est un chercheur principal de recherche agricole de la retraite. Il est également sélectionné de Nord de Cajou et spécialiste de la chaîne de valeur de la Nord de Cajou. Il a plus de 35 ans d'expérience et puis euh, dans la filière en arcade. Post
Pasteur Massaoui est également l'un des principaux sélectionnés de Noir de Cajou et il a déjà contribué à la mise en place de près de 50, 54 nouvelles variétés hybrides. Et puis, euh, il, a conseillé, il a été conseiller technique pour des projets de Noir de Cajou en Mozambique, au Ghana et en Zambie. Et il a, il a été également le directeur adjoint des affaires académiques de Stella Maris de l'Université euh, en Tanzanie. En, 2020, en janvier 2022, il rejoint TechnoServe euh, euh, en tant que directeur de production. Il est vraiment auteur de euh, plus, plus de 66 articles, dont 14 au niveau de la loi de Cajou. Une fois encore, merci, professeur, pour ces euh, expériences que vous venez de partager avec nous. Et à présent, nous allons poursuivre avec la session. Et là, je rappelle encore que cette session fait suite à, à, euh, cette fait suite à la, la conférence ACA tenue à, à Abuja. Donc, pour pouvoir continuer les, les échanges sur la gestion des arbres dans un quartier. Mais avant de laisser la parole aux, euh, aux participants pour des questions, également, on a déjà reçu quelques questions au niveau du chat. Je, également, je rappelle, s'il y a des questions comme ça, les gens peuvent déjà, les, les participants peuvent déjà les laisser au niveau du chat au, et, et au besoin, il y aura quand même des, 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 des prises de parole. Et là, pour pouvoir prendre la parole, on pourra lever la main avant de, de pouvoir participer. Merci encore pour la suite. Alors, professeur, j'ai juste quelques questions pour vous suite à cette brillante présentation. Et là, j'ai noté que vous avez dit que l'élagage est une réduction de rendement de l'arbre, c'est-à-dire que l'élagage égale la perte d'argent. Et là, je me demande si vous pouvez si cela est à relativiser. Est-ce que c'est à long, à moyen terme ou bien toutes les fois qu'on fait des élagages, on, réduit, on, on fait des pertes d'argent. Sinon, ou bien je, je dirais, est-ce que si tel est le cas, il est toujours nécessaire de conseiller au producteur de faire cette opération? Donc ça, c'est la première question. Et la seconde question, la deuxième question, je veux dire, que pensez-vous de ces auteurs qui soutiennent, parce que dans beaucoup de littérature, on a lu que les élagages et les éclaircies permettent d'améliorer le rendement quantitatif et même qualitatif des plantations de cajou. Maintenant, en vous écoutant, euh, est-ce que vous pensez qu'effectivement vous êtes en accord avec ces auteurs qui, qui, qui pensent que toutes les fois qu'on fait ces activités, on améliore aussi bien quantitatif que qualitatif le rendement? La troisième question, j'espère que vous notez. Voilà, la troisième question, euh, que pensez-vous de la gestion de, des arbres de cajou et le, les changements climatiques? Je veux dire, euh, avec l'observation des variations climatiques qu'on observe dans le monde aujourd'hui, avec ce que nous observons en termes de variations climatiques aujourd'hui, est-ce que nous devons revoir nos pratiques ou bien qu'est-ce que vous conseillez dans ce sens pour qu'on puisse, qu puisse mettre ensemble cette question du changement climatique et la gestion des plantations d'anacad Je vais aussi, j'ai aussi noté qu'au cours de votre présentation, on pourra faire des... Des, des tuteurs, c'est-à-dire soutenir les arbres au lieu de couper les branches, on peut les soutenir avec euh, les tuteurs comme ça ou les palissades. Je veux savoir, euh, enfin, je veux demander, professeur, si euh, on peut faire cette activité sur une grande superficie. Est-ce que, euh, compte tenu de les personnes, on connaît des producteurs qui ont plus de 20 hectares, est-ce qu'ils peuvent faire cela sur une étendue aussi, aussi grande? Et enfin, vous avez monté quelques photos vers la fin. Mais la fin pour dire que euh, les, les, les arbres sont drastiquement coupés avec des maladies qui, qui semblent être présentes. Professeur, je voulais aussi savoir s'il si y a une approche selon vos, 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 vos expériences, si on peut trouver une approche pour pouvoir restaurer les canopées de ces arbres-là qui sont drastiquement euh, atteints aujourd'hui. Est-ce qu'il y a une action? Est-ce qu'on peut faire quelque chose pour récupérer ces arbres afin de, de retrouver leur, leur production? Voilà, merci professeur. Voilà quelques questions que j'ai pu ressortir lors de votre présentation. Donc, nous allons peut-être recevoir quelques, euh, s'il y a des réponses pour ces quelques questions, et après quoi nous allons laisser la, la place aux participants afin qu'ils puissent, qu puissent aussi poser des questions. Et aussi, s'il y a des questions au niveau du chat, je trouve qu'il y a des questions au niveau du chat, donc on pourra aussi les poser rapidement. Professeur, voilà les quelques questions. Ok, okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much, much for your very important, important question. question.
Um, it, it should be noted that uh, annual pruning is necessary at the end of every harvesting season. The problem is to what extent that the branches are pruned. That is the question that needs to be answered. It should be known cashew is a sunlight tree. It does not produce where branches touch one another or where it is shaded by another tree. Cashew produces the entire canopy, as I mentioned, when it is young, up to the age of 10 years. But as I insisted, it does not produce on top of the branches when the tree is 15 years old and above. It only produces at the periphery, the lower branches. So the more branches you cut, the less the yield you get. Now, um, is that why, why do we do, we do pruning? We do pruning in order to uh, allow nut pollination to take place underneath the cashew tree. Um, you said also that um, if so, for bush trees at what height from the ground would you recommend to cut the branches? I am not, not really recommending anyone, anyone to cut cashew branches. You will only need to cut them, them if they obstruct harvesting or if they obstruct tractor movement in the farm. farm. If, if not, not, there is no need, need really to remove the branches. branches. I also thought about, about uh, other that others that uh, ought to like think about all of us arguing and improving yields. As I mentioned, branches, branches that, produce branches that produce yield are the lower branches. And, and once, once you remove them, them you are removing the, 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 the area, area under production. production. So, so what, what I can, can say for those of us is that, that no data. data no right, right to speak. If, if someone, someone thinks, thinks that, that pruning can increase the yield, let the person come up with data. data. Otherwise, those, those are just mere waste of discussion. Because, because if, if you remove, remove the production, production area with, with an intention of improving production, that is ridiculous. Maybe, maybe one would have said we pruned in order to allow mechanical operations, operations to take place. That, that one, one, I will, uh, I will, I will entirely agree with it. it. Regarding the, the component, component of um, uh, uh, cash tree management and climate, climate change, change. As, as I mentioned, mentioned cash tree is evergreen through our year, year. and uh, it, it is, is very good for climate mitigation. Which, which means very green throughout the year, it undertakes carbon sequestration throughout the year. And the carbon sequestration takes place on the three canopies. So when you overprune, certainly you are, you are making the carbon sequestration to be low. So to me, I still think that um, we, we do, do a, a modest pruning to allow the things that I mentioned for economic reasons, for operational reasons, and leave the tree canopy to continue growing as it is for wood climate mitigation. Now, regarding the trees which were already overgrown, like, like the ones I showed you in my farm. farm. It, it has, has taken, taken four years. years. They have never come back into the full production. So, so for, for those, those old trees which have been overpruned, what we need to do is to stop pruning and allow the canopy to develop. After four to ten years, the tree will acquire its original canopy. One thing which we have to understand is there is a relationship between the amount of root system and the canopy development. 
when we use, use the canopy for overpruning, certainly some of the root system, system disappears also. Vous parlez? On ne vous reçoit plus. Allô? Allô? Oui. On vous reçoit. Yes. yes. So shall, shall I repeat, I repeat again, again the, 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 the last two questions? questions. He, he was, was talking, talking about uh, the relationship between cash cream management and uh, climate change. I, I said, said cash is about, about green through our year, year and, and that, that is what makes, makes it to be a very good tree crop, crop for climate mitigation. mitigation. Now, when, when you overprune the cashew trees, trees, it means you are, are using the area which undertakes carbon sequestration. So prune for, for the reasons I mentioned before, and not to do overpruning. The last question was about what would happen to the trees which were already overpruned. The case is also the same in my, in my farm. farm. I, I left the trees untouched. The trees, trees now is four years. years. They, they have not recovered the canopy fully, but at least, least at the fourth year, I will start, start getting some yield, yield from, from the overgrown trees. It means for, for the past three years, I have been losing the crop. So, so I'll start, start getting it after the fourth year. year. So, so overgrown the trees, leave them as they, they are without, without any further, further destruction for the tree, tree to recover its canopy. Please, Please be informed of overgrowing also. also. There is a relationship, relationship between the root system, system and the canopy size. When, when you can use the canopy of already existing tree, some, some root, root system in, in the soil also, also they are reduced. They, they die, die naturally. naturally. So, um, but, but once, once you leave it for some years, years four years above, then the canopy will resume, resume its normal. normal. And then uh, we, we should avoid now undertaking the same mistakes once this is clearly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Merci, Professor. Merci uh, pour ces questions. Euh, pour ces réponses, j'avais dit. Euh, déjà, je veux revenir un peu sur le tutorage. Est-ce que vous avez expérimenté le tutorage sur une grande superficie? Est-ce que c'est est vraiment aisé? Est-ce que vous avez une expérience euh, dans, ce, dans ce domaine de tutorage? Compte tenu des superficies euh, que nous avons euh, dans l'Afrique de l'Ouest où les gens ont beaucoup de surface, beaucoup d'arbres, est-ce que c'est est aussi aisé ou bien quelle expérience vous avez dans, dans, dans ce cadre? Yes, surely, uh, regarding the stakings, is that like, um, for large scale farms, there's no way you can undertake staking. There's no way, and apparently unnecessary. For large scale uh, farms, like the farms I showed there for the Nalegal Agriculture Research Institute, they do not practice uh, staking because you have to, to, to consider two aspects. If you lose taking, it means tractor operation will be obstructed. And the cost of maintaining 600 hectares under cash research is very high compared to what you lose when you remove some of the branches to allow the tractor to pass through. So large scale plantations, pruning is important annually to ensure that Mechanical operations can take place in the farm. I hope. 
you understood my my answer oui oui très bien compris merci encore pour cette réponse euh, nous allons euh, à présent euh, passer aux quelques questions des participants et les questions qu'on retrouve au niveau du chat et là la première question et il y a un participant, je crois, du nom de Théodore, qui voulait quand même savoir la différence entre le rendement des plans greffés et les plans non greffés. Il y a une différence de rendement. Yes, sure. There is a very big difference in it. Uh, it should be noted that... Uh, a grafted seedling starts producing in the first year of production. Non-grafted seedlings, when planted in the field, they will start producing on the third or the fourth year. But grafted seedling, it means you know the quality of the clone you have grafted, which is automatically very high yield. But for non-grafted, it all depends. If they are coming from polygonal or clonal seeds, they are also high yield. But in the first five years, surely the grafted seedlings will produce more than ungrafted seedlings. But eight to 10 years, the difference will disappear. Ok, merci encore. Et une autre question, professeur. Euh, monsieur Daniel euh, a noté que vous avez dit qu'il y a moins de problèmes de, de ravageurs, de maladies et, en Afrique. Et, mais lui, il trouve qu'ils en ont au Nigeria, euh, notamment les problèmes de, les problèmes de, de, de fourreurs de tiges. Voilà, les problèmes de fourreurs de tiges. Il dit, selon votre expérience, quelle est la, la, la meilleure approche de, de gestion de, ou bien de lutte contre ce ravageur, professeur? Vous m'avez écouté? Professeur, euh, je répète, je le redis un peu la question de M. Daniel. Il dit que dans votre présentation, vous n'avez pas, vous avez dit qu'il y a moins de problèmes euh, en matière de, 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 de ravageurs, de maladies en Afrique. Mais lui, il note qu'il y a I des was, problèmes de maladies. Je suis connecté. OK. OK. Can you repeat again uh, the network? OK. Yes. La question de Daniel, Can Monsieur Daniel, il dit que, well, yes. Yes. il dit que euh, dans la présentation du professeur, il a noté qu'il a, qu a dit qu'il y a moins de, de problèmes de maladies ou d'insectes en Afrique, mais que lui, a, au Nigeria, ils ont, ils ont ces problèmes, et notamment les problèmes de forêt de tiges. Qu'est-ce qu'il pense, qu'est-ce que le professeur pense en matière de gestion, en matière de contrôle de ces maladies selon son expérience. Voilà, c'était ça la question, professeur. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. First, first of all, we should separate uh, between diseases and the insect pests. In West Africa, the entire West Africa, Benin, Nigeria, Ghana, Ivory Coast, Guinea-Bissau. I visited all those areas. There is no any cashew disease of economic importance. Although people keep on saying diseases and pests, but actually there is no diseases of economic importance. In East Africa, if you don't control powdery mildew disease, if you don't control blight, you lose 80 to 90% of the crop, which is not the case. So cost of production in East Africa is very high compared to West Africa. You do not use fungicide here in order to increase yield and the quality of the nuts. 
in East Africa, you must, you must use fungicides to control the disease in order to improve yields and the nut quality. But on the other hand, pests, pests we see in Africa, also in West Africa, which includes pseudotherapsis UI. Some of them, they call them aeroplane bugs. The T mosquito, uh, the helopeltis bugs, and uh, the one you mentioned, stem borers. There are different types of stem borers. There are some of them giddlers, some of them they bore, but they are all in East and West Africa. But pests in West Africa, they contribute very little in, a, in, a, in a increasing or, or in decreasing yield. But be informed, stem borers are sometimes severe when farm management operations are not done properly. If you get a chance and visit farmers in Tanzania, they clean the farm to remove completely all the weeds and all cashew leaves that have fallen in every year. They remove everything and the land remains almost bare. One would think maybe there will be something like uh, um, erosion because of that one, but in reality, there's nothing like that. But they do it for two reasons. One is to avoid fire. Secondly, is to avoid uh, the stem borers. So many, many the stem borers are physical. You cannot use any insecticide to control the stem borers. Whenever you see the symptoms of the stem borers, you need to use a machine to open the place and remove the lava which is inside. And once it drops on the ground, it will die naturally, or you'll find that there are some other insects which will kill. Otherwise, there's no uh, really um, a recommended measure to, to the stem borers uh, using uh, chemicals. However, the other sucking pests, like aeroplane bugs, some of them, they call them coconut bugs. It is commonly known as aeroplane bugs in West Africa. That one can be controlled uh, naturally by using natural predators, Ocophila longinoda. This has been very effective uh, as a organic way, it's a natural way of controlling the, 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 the pests. But sucking pests like uh, helopeltis bugs, surely we're using uh, insecticides. If it doesn't reach the economic situation, there's no point of doing it. But uh, normally, uh, when you look at the uh, most farmers here, you find that uh, I have never seen really a severe, severe farm which has been affected by the sucking pest the way it normally happens in, in East Africa. But I'm not saying we should not control. Avoid, please, using uh, intercrops which share the same pest with the cashew because it might be the source of multiplication of the pests. I hope I was clear about it. Hello. I Um, Prof, we heard you clearly. Joseph, please, are you back on? Yeah, yeah, yes. Oui, oui. Hello, Joseph? Yes, yes, blessing. I can hear you. Okay, please continue. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I responded to the question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Yes, oui, oui, il a répondu à pratiquement toutes les questions. Merci encore. Et... 
prof, Mr. Martins said that uh, in your presentation, you focus more on production efficiency come in regard to regenerative occur management and border sustainability outcome. What is your perspective on the current state of regenerative agricultural practice in, in Africa cashew farm? It again, please, it was cutting. It was breaking, I didn't get the question. Can you repeat the question again? Yes, yes. He, he, he need to know what regenerative practice needs to be promised currently in uh, our Africa condition. Regenerative? Oh, we are talking about rehabilitation. Il a utilisé régénération, euh, mais là, je pense que c'est réhabilitation euh, et la gage, il veut peut-être dire. Sinon, il, pense, il, il voulait quand même savoir ce que nous, euh, le prof, conseille ou bien ce qu'on conseille actuellement après ces séances-là pour pouvoir retenir. Je pense que ça faisait partie des premières questions que j'ai posées au prof. Et donc, euh, euh, sinon, c'est parce que lui, il a utilisé le mot régénérer que je me demandais si le prof avait mieux compris. Je pense que c'est dans le sens de l'élagage éclairci. Et là, le prof a quand même souhaité qu'on qu fasse moins de, de coupes et, et puis qu'on qu qu laisse quand même les arbres bien se développer. Je pense que, vous savez, certaines des petites plantations par des petits holders farmers en uh, West Africa. They were planted in an improper spacing. And uh, at the earlier stages of growth, okay. the farmers were getting yield properly. But when they started overlapping, the farmer is getting less because wherever the copy touches one another, it does not produce any yield. For such farms, we are advocating what we call rehabilitation. And uh, rehabilitation is a process of bringing unproductive farm into production. And this one involves thinning of the trees to allow the canopy not to touch one another. It also involves gap filling where thinning was severely done and uh, there was too much space left behind. Also, it will involve intercropping in order for the farmer to take care of the food, food security. And uh, it is this aspect of rehabilitation. I was talking about how do we cut the big branches of the cashew in order to heal it properly. I was actually citing the rehabilitation um, uh, point of view, rather than the trees which are properly spaced. One thing which I want all of you to understand is, there is a tendency of most development saying the spacing of cashew trees is 10 meters by 10 meters. My brother, let, let me tell you the truth. If you want to know the proper spacing of the cashew tree, do not listen to what people are saying. Go into the farmer's field, measure the canopy of the trees in that particular area, and take the average. You will realize that a spacing of 10 meters by 10 meters between and within rows, it depends on rainfall pattern, soil types. Where rainfalls are above 1,300 millimeters, I am telling you spacing of 10 by 10 is not adequate. You must be forced to go for a spacing of 12 by 12. Thank you. Merci, professeur. Je pense la dernière question. Est-ce qu'on recommanderait à, 
à, aux, aux producteurs, ceux qui s'intéressent beaucoup plus à la production des greffons, est-ce qu'on leur recommanderait euh, euh, un type de, 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 de lagage ou quelle, sont, quelle est la bonne approche pour les, les gens qui gèrent les gémoplages? Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, uh, for uh, those who are owning uh, nurseries, the nursery operators, nursery operators should plant, they improve the planting material close to their nurseries. And the spacing can be 1.5 meters by 2 meters, which means high density cultivation. And uh, you stop the tree growth at the height of one meter. You cut it completely. Then anything sprouting above one meter will already be scions of which are ready for grafting. And this is exactly what I showed in one of the slides when I said tree training. You stop the growth of the tree. Since it is already uh, a grafted one, it has flowering hormones. And uh, the moment you cut, the science will be ready for harvesting after every 21 days. Okay, is that clear? Hello, Joseph. Yeah, yes, Prof. It's okay. Okay, donc, merci, professeur. Et je pense que nous sommes en train de tendre vers la fin. Euh, monsieur Yemana, Monsieur Boti, vous avez entre-temps levé la main. Est-ce que vous voulez poser votre question à, en direct ou bien c'est bon par la suite si il euh, y a des questions en direct, on peut prendre une ou deux questions, puisque là, nous sommes déjà vers la fin pour euh, le prof par rapport à sa communication. Est-ce que M. Yemana, M. Boti, vous êtes là? Euh, bon, euh, je n'ai pas vu de retour euh, concernant leurs questions. Et là, nous venons de, de découler eh, pratiquement les questions. Sinon, euh, la dernière question, c'était de savoir de façon précise quelle est la période qui est vraiment recommandée selon l'expérience du professeur pour faire ces pratiques de délagage. La période, est-ce que c'est en saison sèche ou en saison pluvieuse que c'est plus adapté? Vous m'avez reçu? Um, yeah, surely. Uh, no. Pruning, pruning must be done at the end of harvesting season. And this is the time when the tree is going into a state of dormancy. And normally it takes about two months or two and a half months. If you do pruning at that time, that is fine. But I noted people doing pruning even three, four months after harvesting season comes to an end. That's not proper because you will be losing the, the crop for that particular season. Okay, this is Eric. Can I ask to ask my question? Oui, vous pouvez poser. Okay, so uh, I heard during the presentation when it comes to the issue of a uh, grafting, and I think I heard something like uh, when you do the grafting and while somebody does the direct uh, planting as C2, uh, if made from the beginning, they might all still see maybe similar yields, but as they mature in the ages, the grafting, the grafted uh, tree. Uh, would have superseded that of the one which was not grafted. If that is true, uh, should we usually give more education 
to those doing grafting. Because in Ghana, when you go towards the northern side, some of the farmers in Bole had the issue of not going to uh, use grafted seedlings. The reason being that at the research institution, those doing the grafting are given targets for a day. And they are advised to enter into the scion bank to cut scions for the grafting. And on the way to the scion banks, there are a lot of trees still at the research institution. And so some of these people doing the grafting, still some of them do not go direct to the uh, required scion bank, but they tend to cut scions from any of the nine trees on the road so that it reduces the, the distance of their walking to the far place to cut the scions and they are able to come back to graft and they are, they are able to meet their target. When you ask them, their uh, concern is that it is grafted. And as long as it is grafted, it will yield the required uh, uh, yield, which is uh, uh, maybe required. So for me, if we, I think if you don't do more education, that yes, it is true that you can do grafting at some point where the grafted seedlings might maybe overtake the normal ones. But if you just use say, the word grafting, everybody just go to get silent everywhere at all and then graft. And at the end of the day, you have graft actually, but you are not getting the required yield. Because as I now in Bole, as I said, some farmers, because of this experience, there is no way you can still advise them to go for grafting, which they will. Thank you. You are very, very correct. And uh, you are very correct in the sense that um, this is a situation where we are introducing uh, grafting while we have not prepared the ground for the nursery operators to be accountable if the farmer collects and they do not get what they were expecting. Um, what uh, we did in Tanzania, or what I did in Tanzania, I prepared what I call a clonal catalog. We had 22 uh, selected varieties. We have 54 uh, released the cash varieties and hybrids. The farmer has the right to choose among the 54. And he comes and say, maybe I want the variety A, B, and C only. And uh, the nursery will provide the farmer with those ones. If it is grafted, even after one year or two years, the farmer will be able to compare what is in the catalog and what it has been, um, it has been grafted in their own farm. So nursery operators, they should be made accountable by the state that whatever they give to the farmers, it must exactly be reflected into the colonial catalog. So what is missing in Ghana? I was there in Bole, 2008, 2006 to 2008. I was working in Ghana as a technical advisor for the cash flow development project. But uh, we didn't go too far in terms of developing the, 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 the colonial catalog. It's very important for the researchers now to ensure that they prepare clonal catalog, which indicates the performance of the selected varieties or selected clones, the color, the branching pattern, and everything. But at the moment, most of the development partners, they just go and say graft, graft, and graft. Sometimes they graft the rubbish and give it to the farmers. Sometimes they think grafting is a method of improving yield. It's not true. Yeah. Grafting is multiplication of the planting material. You get a true to type. So if you graft a very good variety, you will continue getting a very good variety. And the other way around, if you graft a bad one, you will also get a bad one. So this is a, a concept of country to put a mechanism in place to control the silent production. What I did in Tanzania was we developed seven cash nut development centers, which were owned by the research station. And those were the only sources 
of planting material to farmers. Until today, farmers, they are allowed to go and collect science free of charge. They pay nothing. Interestingly, when I had a meeting, I, I, uh, when we had a study tour with the researchers in, uh, in Benin, they went and see farmers now, they are multiplying the planting material for their own trees in their own farms. They are even doing the top work of improved material in their own farm after knowing the characteristics of the material. So in West Africa, what I could say is, you started running too fast instead of passing through the stages which you went through uh, in, in East Africa, which I mean Mozambique and, the, and the Tanzania. So we need to put a control system in place. Nursery operators must have a catalog indicating that this is the performance or the materials in my cyan orchard. And when you get a grafted ceiling from this orchard, this is the expectation in terms of yield, in terms of the canopy shape, in terms of the nut size and the fruit color, and not otherwise. There's no shortcut. These things must be done. I hope I responded to your question. Hello. Yes, we, exa Monsieur Eric. Ex exactly. Oh. I'm, I'm, I'm highly satisfied. At least I can give you a 99.9. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Merci, Eric. <laughs> OK. Uh, je ne sais pas si Monsieur Yemana est là aussi pour sa question. Bon, il y avait aussi la main levée de uh, Monsieur Mamadou, je crois. Oui. Est-ce que toujours la main est levée? Oui. Ok, allez, allez-y, il y avait votre question. Voilà, euh, merci beaucoup, M. Joseph. Euh, je remercie le, le professeur de la présentation euh, par rapport euh, aux techniques de légage et pour améliorer un peu la production. Bon, moi, j'ai juste une contribution que je voulais faire par rapport à la présentation parce que nous sommes au, au Sénégal, je suis dans le programme Lift Cachou de Shelter for Life. Donc, euh, nous ici, euh, vous savez, on a, on a, on a dans nos zones d'intervention des, des plantations qui sont très denses. Donc, euh, les producteurs, ils n'ont ils pas eu la mentalité de faire des plantations qui sont linéaires. Donc, euh, les, les champs sont plantés en, en désordre. Et par rapport à cela, pour vraiment améliorer la production, nous avons pu mettre en place ce qu'on appelle des parcelles de démonstration. Et... Au niveau de ces parcelles de démonstration, nous avons, nous avons mis une parcelle pour moins et une parcelle où on a fait des bonnes pratiques pour montrer aux producteurs qu'il est important de faire l'élégage, il est important de faire euh, l'éclaircie. Okay. Maintenant, si ces parcelles de démonstration, nous avons mis euh, un demi-hectare et il y a un quart d'hectare où les bonnes pratiques ont été appliquées, et l'autre témoin où on applique les, les pratiques paysannes. Et à l'issue de ces, de, ces, de ces résultats, nous avons obtenu une amélioration des rendements euh, de la parcelle où on pratique les bonnes pratiques de 150% par rapport aux témoins sur euh, l'élégage. Et ceci, nous l'avons fait, on a corrigé la densité, on a corrigé aussi euh, l'encombrement. Euh, c'est pour vous dire que vraiment c'est très important par rapport parce que c'est aussi des plantations qui sont âgées, qui ont plus de 10 ans voire 15 ans d'âge. Et euh, je voulais aussi euh, poser la question au professeur par rapport à ça. Est-ce que le fait de dire qu'on peut faire des tuteurs par rapport aux, aux arbres, et si vraiment on a une, une densité qui est forte est-ce que est -ce possible de pouvoir faire tout ce champ-là avec des tuteurs ou bien est-ce qu'il faut recommander de faire l'éclaircie pour jouer un peu sur l'encombrement Parce que j'ai vu dans sa présentation aussi, il a parlé que euh, les, les arbres dans le quartier euh, produisent sur, euh, sur les flancs, sur les côtés, donc pas en, en, en hauteur, parce qu'en hauteur, effectivement, en hauteur, on ne voit pas. Mais est-ce que, euh, bon, je ne partage pas à 100%, 
le fait de dire que si on élague une branche, on risque de, de, de faire baisser la pollution parce que nous, on a déjà testé cela et on continue toujours à le faire pour le, pour le justifier aussi scientifiquement. On est en train de travailler là-dessus pour pouvoir euh, amener des, 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 des réponses scientifiques euh, par rapport à l'élégage. Bon, maintenant, je ne sais pas, est-ce que ça ne nécessite pas encore de faire des études beaucoup plus poussées pour voir le contexte Parce qu'il y a des producteurs qui ont des plantes linéaire il y a d'autres qui ont des présentations à des autres et c'est aussi en fonction de en fonction de la ok merci Merci, yeah, professeur. Euh... Vous avez écouté un peu, M. Mamadou, par rapport à son intervention concernant les modèles femmes, les passés de démonstration et puis les résultats, quelques résultats qu'ils ont obtenus en matière de lagage, bon, où il n'est pas euh, à 100% d'accord. Mais est-ce que, euh, qu'est-ce que vous pensez? Oui, merci beaucoup. Je voulais juste mettre les choses très do not misunderstand mm -hmm. when I say no pruning. A farm which is overcrowded, you need to do both thinning mm -hmm. and also to do pruning. By so doing, actually, you increase yield. Mm -hmm. Do you know why? Because the, you have opened the production area of the canopy which was not producing now to start producing. Overcrowded farm, if you do proper thinning, you will double the production of that particular farm in just a period of two seasons, which means if at the end of the harvesting season, you do thinning immediately, then two years later, that farm will double its production. There is no doubt about that. That is actually what we are trying to do here in Benin, that we have established this year 23 demonstration plots on rehabilitation. And the, the main aspect of doing that one was to ensure that the farmer knows what he has been producing. And after two years, the farmer will give it, be keeping the record on how the, 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 the yield has been increasing. So with rehabilitation, no discussion about pruning, no discussion about thin, because that is the proper procedure. And actually, half an acre is enough demonstration. But what we normally do is, in that half an acre, you have to invite farmers around that area so that they know what is the performance of the farm before and what will be the performance of the farm after rehabilitation has been taking place. That is the best approach. We did it in Tanzania, we did it in Mozambique, and now this is time for the West Africa to start doing rehabilitation. In Tanzania, many cashew producing areas, this is no longer an issue. It's no longer an issue of, uh, there's nothing like trees overcrowding. Farmers, they know what to do regarding that one, because we established almost 59 uh, demonstration plots, which farmers, they copied it, and they are now, they have been multiplying. But in Tanzania also, non-main cash producing areas, we have a similar problem like the one we have in, in, in West Africa here, and demo plots remains to be the, the only solution. So we should not mix up pruning, training, formative pruning, of new plantation with pruning and the thing of overcrowded plantation. Those are two different sites which needs different management of their sites. I hope it is clear. 
Oui, c'est bien compris, bien noté. Merci pour cette réponse, pour cette clarification à présent. Euh, Monsieur Martin, si euh, vous êtes toujours là, vous pouvez rapidement poser votre question. Monsieur Martin. Yes. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, thank you, Professor Massawi. I am Martin and I'm, I'm coming from a sustainability circular economy background. And to make a follow up to my earlier question regarding the regenerative practices, uh, uh, my concern is that uh, you mentioned or you discussed uh, practices which are good agricultural practices, which I can say intercept overlap with sustainability practices. Um, but I'm trying to get to the point whereby with increasing laws, particularly in EU and other places where many countries are moving towards circular economy uh, policies. My concern is that uh, for the farm management uh, and in the language of sustainability and circular economy, what we talk about is the regenerative practices. And so I'm trying to get your perspective in case you have any as to if you want to go on that tangent, because in my understanding, you sort of focus more on outcomes of, on, on, on the economic performance and, and general efficiency of the production. But if you have to sort of look at this kind of perspective, you know, and also to align these funds with the agenda of circular economy and to, I mean, these higher consumption countries, uh, what could be the possible uh, concerns, you know, that the farmers need to practice or need to be encouraged um, so yeah, this is my concern. So I'm just saying that what could be the, the, the priorities if we have to look at this uh, from uh, the angle of regenerative practices in trying to meet uh, potential regulations from higher consuming regions. Thank you very much. Um, one thing which really uh, probably, I didn't catch your question very well, but uh, uh, it's like, it seems like, uh, first of all, we do not normally introduce new techniques and technology to the farm, cash farmers directly. We don't. It's not like maize, it's not like beans, where you go and demonstrate and the farmers will follow once they see the yield. In cashew, we normally do all our demonstration plots in farmer fields and we normally involves the farmers themselves i'll tell you why we might think the farmer has planted at a wider spacing and we want to encourage the farmer to plant at a closer spacing but we have to know why the farmer planted the cashew in a wider spacing well one of the reasons is about food security so if the issue is food security, the farmer would never accept you are closer spacing because you think it's a good agronomic practices. But once you know uh, why the farmer is doing certain practices, is from there you can learn what you can advise the farmer and make sure that uh, if it's a demonstration plot, it should be a research extension staff and the farmer manage the trials. These three tri triangles, they, they will be very important in uh, understanding exactly what should be done and when and where it should be done. So research, farmer, extension, demo plots can be done in form of farmer field schools where applicable, or we can do it the other way around depending on the cultural aspects of different countries. OK, merci, merci, professeur. Um, je pense qu'il y a une dernière question. Peut-être que le prof avait déjà euh, dit un peu, avait donné un pas à cette question de Monsieur Don. Euh, en fait, il voulait quand même savoir quel est, en termes de de séparation en termes de distance entre les arbres de cajou, euh, les, les polyclonaux installés, lorsqu'on veut faire de, de culture intercalaire dans la plantation et lorsqu'on ne veut pas faire. 
Il veut aussi savoir, quand on parle de densité, de faible densité, de densité moyenne, de haute densité, euh, par, ça, 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 on fait allusion à quoi par rapport à la séparation, par rapport à la distance qui sépare les arbres. Voilà euh, sa question, professeur. Je ne sais pas si vous avez quelque chose à apporter comme réponse. Vous m'avez reçu? Okay. Yes, 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 I get you. I, oh. Actually, um, I think there is a, a lot of misuse of the word polyclonal A lot of misuse. In the first place, there are only three countries in the world that they have polyclonal seed orchards. And uh, everybody thinks uh, polyclonal is just a polyclonal, is just a seed. It's not true. You can get polyclonal seed orchards in Tanzania and in Mozambique, and currently Benin. They are in their second year of establishment, and the plan is to establish even much more polyclonal seed orchards. What is polyclonal seed orchard? Polyclonal seed orchard is planted using elite material or registered or selected cashew varieties. As far as cashew is concerned, there's only one country in Africa that has cashew varieties, that is Tanzania. Mozambique, they have improved the planting material. They have never registered them as cashew varieties. In many countries, in Ghana, they have quite a number of improved planting material, but they have never developed them to be registered as a commercial varieties. But if we have elite material with known records of their performance, those are the materials which are selected to be included in the polyclonal seed plantation. And the polyclonal seed plantation, it has a special design, which most people don't understand, they even don't know. So it is called a systemic design or next neighbor design. Normally, it is partitioned into four blocks, and each block has an equal number of the same varieties planted, but in each block, the neighbor in block A will not be a neighbor in block B, neither block, neighbor in block C or block D. And that's why you call it poly. Poly, it means many clones planted together in a special design, and whatever is harvested from there, is called a polyclonal seed. Secondly, we have clonal seeds, which are also used as a source of planting material. Clonal seeds are obtained from orchard, which has been cloned. So the, the selected varieties or the elite selected mother trees, they are planted in rows with an objective of harvesting science, but whatever that is generated from there is called the clonal seed. It can also be used as an improved planting material. So we have to be very careful when we are using our words of polyclonal or non-polyclonal or the, the grafted seedlings. I wanted to put that one very clear. Is it understood? Oui, Hello. professeur. Je crois que euh, en général, ça peut aller. C'est vous avez déjà essayé d'apporter autant de, de réponses pour ces différentes questions. Et je pense que c'est la dernière question que qu'on avait dans le chat. Et il n'y a plus de mains levées. Euh, je crois que euh, nous tendons vers la fin. Et là, une fois encore, il faut noter que une bonne gestion des des arbres dans un quartier passe par un bon suivi. Euh, de, de, bons, de bons élagages pour quand même éviter, pour éviter que euh, les plants ne, soient, euh, ne se chevauchent pour empêcher l'ensoleillement et une bonne gestion passe par effectivement cet entretien correct, ce suivi régulier afin de permettre aux arbres de mieux profiter des éléments nutritifs, de la réaction et tout. 
Merci encore, professeur, pour ce temps qu'il a accordé euh, pour cette présentation, cette excellente présentation qui nous a permis encore d'avoir une connaissance approfondie sur euh, la gestion des arbres d'Anacadier. Mais avant de finir, nous allons quand même demander au professeur par rapport à ces différentes interventions, par rapport à toutes ces, ces interactions que nous avons eues de la part des participants, euh, qu'est-ce qu'il qu qu euh, voudrait dire par, euh, aux participants à, pour l'entretien des VG d'Anacad comme mot de fin, comme mot de conclusion. Merci, professeur. Uh, basically, uh, I was very much impressed by the contribution of the participants. Um, I think uh, I'm here in Benin. I am sharing a similar problem. That's why I am also trying to work very hard to establish the demo plots. Actually, last year we established uh, this season, which has just gone, we established the 23 rehabilitation demonstration plots and uh, parallel to that one also we established um, new plantings the main objective of having both trials in one place is we have selected 23 elite mother trees and uh, their performance is not yet known then it will be start being recorded from the polyclonal seed orchards we have established in two locations in the north and in the southern part of Benin. But data will be collected from those plots, 23 plots established in farmers' fields. We'll train the farmer how to manage the young grafted cashew seedlings, grafted cashew trees. And they will see what will be happening to the rehabilitated farm. Of course, we are, we are involving all farmers around that place because we have pro leader farmers who are operating with us. This year, we are planning to establish additional 2020 new rehabilitation plots and 20 new plantings in the other municipalities. Those will be maintained for a period of three years. After three years, I'm telling you, farmer will have a knowledge which is suitable for rehabilitation. Farmers will have a better knowledge on the management of the grafted seedlings. Good things actually goes very fast when it is done among the farmers. So what we are expecting is the moment we start seeing good results, we will be taking farmers from different places to go and interact with the owner of the demonstration plots and exchange ideas with their own local languages so that uh, they, can, they can go and copy what has been taking place there. So I was so very happy. I'm so happy to hear from um, Senegal. Um, I'm aware of the project which is taking place there. Senegal has a very, very good material. One of my selected planting materials in Tanzania originated from Senegal. Um, they have good materials, but the problem, they have not been selected. So projects should assist casual research centers to be able to uh, select LET mother trees using selection criteria. They can consult me. I have no problem to share knowledge with them. Thank you very much for your cooperation and thank you very much for your good questions. Hope you next time we'll meet again for other things not only the management of the cashew trees. Thank you. Merci, professeur, pour ces mots de fin. Merci, nous disons merci encore à tous les participants pour cette euh, participation qui a été très active et qui a été euh, très intéressante, qui est très appréciée. Donc, tout le monde a participé, ce qui nous a permis d'avoir encore une vue beaucoup plus généralisé sur cette question de gestion des arbres d'anacadier. Un merci spécial à, à, à euh, M. Tanguépon qui a été de bout en bout avec nous pour, pour suivre cette section. Et merci aussi à, à, à tous ces, ces docteurs, ces professeurs, ces grandes personnalités qui ont laissé leurs activités pour prendre du temps avec nous afin de contribuer, afin de, de, de donner un peu de ce qu'ils ont comme savoir 
ou encore améliorer nos connaissances en, en, en la matière. Une fois encore, merci à tous et, et nous sommes vers la fin. Je vais à présent euh, laisser la place à Blessing pour pouvoir euh, faire donner les mots de clôture. Merci Blessing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Professor Masawe and Dr. Tokoro for this session. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this session. You asked for it and we have heard you and delivered. We, we bring an end to the session on um, expanded insights and the management of cashew trees. We would also like to appreciate our sponsors and partners, USDA Pro Cashew and Benin Cashew for making it possible for us to bring this session to you. Please do let us know areas you would want us to address where we can bring in the likes of Professor Masawe or Dr. Tokuro to address them. Next week, we'll be coming your way with another session of the ACA Global Market Encounter, where we'll be talking about market updates and supply demand balance now and in the future. Same time, nine o'clock um, AM GMT, please do join us. Um, until then, we invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can replay some of those learnings. You may also follow us on our social media pages to, to be abreast with everything that will happen from now to next week Wednesday. Until then, stay safe and bye-bye. continent thriving with opportunities. 70% of the world's cocoa, 53% of the world's cashew. The resource-rich continent is at a turning point. By 2030, Africa will be home to 20% of the world's population and 75% of people aged under 35. Yet, across the continent, some dynamics persist. The continent continues to export raw natural resources at low cost. Meanwhile, the resilience of its economies is tested by unemployment, poverty and a global pandemic. Despite the challenges, together we can unlock this potential. At Arise IIP, our vision is to build an African industry. Our ambition is to shift Africa from a global commodity supplier to a global manufacturing powerhouse. We do this by identifying industrial gaps in African countries. We then design tailor-made infrastructure and solutions to enable the sustainable and local transformation of raw materials. In Gabon, where 85% of the land is covered by dense and pristine rainforest, we created from scratch a vibrant local timber industry. It did not happen overnight. We brought together local timber industry players, 
and attracted foreign investors to create a competitive timber processing ecosystem. For this ecosystem to flourish, we attracted foreign investors, establishing linkages across the whole value chain, organizing trade shows for hosted companies to showcase and market their timber products, and boosting exports. G says Wood Cluster is now composed of 90 companies operating from the first to the third transformation of timber. All of them transforming ethically and sustainably sourced Gabonese wood. In less than 10 years, Gabon shifted from a net log exporter to the first exporter of veneer in Africa and second in the world. In fact, the real impact was much wider and more meaningful with GSS. Arise IIP has created 16,000 jobs, attracted 120 investors coming from 18 different countries, operating in 19 industry sectors. In Togo, Benin and Côte d'Ivoire, our work is underway following the same approach. Cotton, cashew, soya, cocoa. We enable the transformation of local agricultural products with modern infrastructures and integrated logistics services. By investing in local manufacturing, we ultimately seek to replace foreign imports with domestic production. In all our endeavors, we are driven by the pursuit of green, sustainable growth, one that can last for generations to come. We are the pioneer of a green, responsible industrialization one that ensures gender diversity, sustainability, traceability, and a zero waste policy. This is why we create innovative solutions that support a climate conscious economic development in Africa. This starts with neutralizing carbon emissions and creating a positive environmental legacy. By 2022, all of Arise IIP's industrial zones will be carbon neutral, powered fully by solar technology. This is all made possible by the dedication and commitment of the women and men who work at Arise. Together, we are on a journey. A journey to build an African industry. A journey to create a better, more resilient, sustainable and inclusive future for everyone. Arise IIP. Committed to making Africa thrive. Cashew is an increasingly important crop for the countries in West Africa. For Benin 